Hey, thanks, Kyle, and welcome to the Life and Times of a Nakamoto Stacks transaction. So today what I want to talk about a little bit is just kind of take a look at exactly what happens to a Stacks transaction under Nakamoto rules from when it's first broadcasted up to the Stacks network all the way to when it's settled on Bitcoin, finalized on Bitcoin. We'll talk a little bit about what that means on the way as well. Real quick, before we get started, my name's Kenny. I am the developer advocate at the Stacks Foundation. So at the foundation, I focus a lot on developer education, outreach, working on documentation, tutorials, workshops, community growth, pretty much anything that developers are involved in, I'm involved in, and anything that developers need, I try to help kind of facilitate that along. So that's my role at the foundation. <clears throat> now, let's get into two things. Uh, we've all heard that Nakamoto is going to bring fast blocks and Bitcoin finality, but those terms can be a little bit nebulous and hard to define. And so I want to talk a little bit about what we actually mean by that. And what I want to do today is I'm hoping to make these concepts a little bit more concrete for you by walking through exactly what happens with a Stacks transaction under Nakamoto so that you can start to get a little bit more of a concrete picture of what these terms mean and what's actually going to happen with Stacks transactions under Nakamoto rules. So what we're going to start by is covering the ideas behind fast blocks, Bitcoin finality. We're going to kind of cover those at a high level. And then we're going to walk through the journey of a hypothetical Stacks transaction step by step and see exactly when and how it achieves Bitcoin finality. And then we'll look at an illustrated hypothetical example to kind of give a little bit of a little bit of a visual representation to exactly what's going to be happening. So this is the difference between the user experience of a Bitcoin transaction and a Solana transaction. 10 minutes versus a few seconds. It's a huge difference, but we've got a trade-off being made here. The hardware requirements to run a Bitcoin node are very, very low, and the script that runs transactions is very, very simple, which means that Bitcoin can be highly decentralized and secure, but slow as a result. And this is by design, but this is just a trade-off that we need to be we need to be aware of. And Solana kind of went the other direction. And they have higher requirements for running a node, but transactions settle very, very quickly. And so it's got a better user experience when we look at it from that angle. And the goal really with Nakamoto is to get the best of both worlds by using Stacks as this fast L2 on top of Bitcoin with smart contract functionality. So we're getting the, we're getting the fast transaction times of Stacks, we're getting the expressive smart contract functionality, but we're anchoring to Bitcoin so we still get that benefit of Bitcoin security. So there's really two things we're trying to achieve with Nakamoto, fast blocks, in order to provide a good user experience, transactions need to settle within seconds. So the first goal of Nakamoto seeks to accomplish making that happen, and the second is Bitcoin finality. <clears throat> Accomplishing both of these things means that we can create an L2 that'll achieve the security of Bitcoin while having the speed of a faster chain like Solana. So we get the security and we get the user experience. I want to dig into a little bit more this term Bitcoin finality and what we actually mean by that. So the way that I like to define it is the point at which it becomes as hard to reverse a Stacks transaction as it is to reverse a Bitcoin transaction. And this is really how I think about Bitcoin finality in the context of Stacks and of Stacks transactions. So with that little bit of sort of a high level overview of what are we trying to achieve, what are the goals, let's kind of walk through the journey of a Stacks transaction. We'll go over the Nakamoto design in the process, then we'll look at an illustrated example. So step one, journey of a Nakamoto transaction the transaction is broadcasted to the network. User initiates a transaction on their wallet. That transaction is then broadcasted up to the network, gets into the mempool. And then step two, a miner adds it to a block. Assuming that transaction is valid, the miner whose tenure it is, and we'll get more into that in a second, will detect that transaction and add it to the current stacks block. And this process happens on the order of seconds and repeats several times throughout a miner's tenure. So let's go back to that term minor tenure because this is really key to understand for how we can achieve these fast blocks and finality under Nakamoto. So rather than Stacks block production being tied to the cadence of Bitcoin block production, Nakamoto instead uses the concept of minor tenure. So each Bitcoin block, a new miner is cryptographically selected using proof of transfer, and they're cryptographically selected to be the sole producer of blocks during their tenure, which again corresponds to the length of about one Bitcoin block, and they're producing multiple blocks at a fast cadence throughout this tenure. And really this, this decoupling of Stacks block production from Bitcoin block production is how we achieve fast blocks. But that does bring up then a question. If a single miner is responsible for producing several Stacks blocks, how does the system prevent them from just what, having what, adding whatever blocks they want? Since the cryptographic 
selection process only applies to the tenure. Once they have tenure, they're the only miner producing blocks. So how do we sort of add in a control mechanism for that? That's where step three comes in, which is where the miner then sends those block to signers for validation. So at this point, our little hypothetical stacks transaction has been sent up to the mempool. It's been included in a block. And now the miner's taken that block and passed it along to signers to validation. Next step is that those signers are either going to accept or reject that block. So now our transactions packaged up alongside a bunch of other transactions in a stacks block. And now it's been passed from the miner into the hands of signers and 70% of them need to agree on its validity for it to be added to the chain. So by creating this cooperative relationship, um, we can have fast blocks while actually improving the security of the whole block production process in general, because both of these parties are economically incentivized in order to do their job faithfully and do it well. Next step after they, the signers reach that 70% agreement, then the block's going to be replicated to the rest of the network. So at this point, our transaction can be considered settled and confirmed on the stack side of things. And so from a UX perspective, uh, this whole process took you know, anywhere from you know, five to 10 seconds as an estimate for, for what it's looking like right now. And so from a UX perspective, um, this is significantly better than where we are than we were before. Um, the transactions now been included in the stacks chain and the stacks block. And then from here, we sort of rinse and repeat with more blocks. Again, a miner will produce several blocks over their tenure. So this process is going to happen over and over throughout their tenure, which is then going to lead us into step seven, which is the tenure change. And this is a really critical part of the workflow. And how this happens is how we can achieve Bitcoin finality is through what happens during this tenure change process. So we're going to break this part down into a few sub steps. So step 7.1 is a new miner submits a block commit transaction. So we've got miner A that's been mining, creating stacks blocks during their tenure. And now we've got stacks miner B that's going to come in and submit a block commit transaction. And the system selects a winning miner for the next tenure based on their block commit transaction. And that includes one really key field called an index block hash. Let's spend a couple minutes going over exactly what this index block hash is because it's very important. So the index block hash is the previous miners. So we've got miner A, miner B. This miner A's first ever produced stacks block. And so this field is the key to Bitcoin finality because a block commit transaction is written by a stacks miner to the Bitcoin chain. So this is the key to Bitcoin finality because this is the field that gets written to the Bitcoin chain upon a new miner starting their tenure. And then when the next miner after that does the same thing with the previous block, we have this chain of these index block hashes, which are the hash of the entire chain state of stacks. And we have those anchored to every single Bitcoin block. And that's what creates that, creates that chain of stacks history. So this index block hash is, it's the hash of the hash of all previously accepted Bitcoin transactions that Stacks recognizes and the hash of this uh, Stacks block itself. And so this anchors Stacks chain history to the Bitcoin chain history up to the start of the previous miner's tenure. Again, talking about all this can feel a little bit fuzzy. And so that's why we're going to talk all of it at a high level, kind of go through what we're talking about. And then we'll look at a little bit of an illustrated example to try and visualize some of this stuff. <clears throat> So including this field in a miner's block commit means that we can we can ensure Bitcoin finality because at the next Bitcoin block, the state of the stacks chain at the start of the previous Bitcoin block is written to Bitcoin itself. And that means that if we wanted to rewrite stacks history of 10 year A, we'd have to rewrite Bitcoin history all the way back to 10 year B, the block that follows it. So then let's move from there to step 7.2, which is where stacker, stackers will actually initiate a 10 year chain tenure change transaction on the stack side. So once a stacks miner submitted a winning block commit that includes this index block hash that we just went over, the stackers are then going to initiate a tenure change transaction. And in this tenure change transaction, they're going to agree on what the last signed block of this miner will be. So let's say that miner A, during their tenure, they mined 10 stacks blocks. The stackers, once they initiate this tenure change transaction, they're going to collectively decide that Block 10 is the last block that stacks miner A will mine. And then they are going to enforce that miner B comes in and has to build on top of that block. They cannot fork and go build off of their own or orphan any of those transactions. They have to build starting right there at that block and move linearly forward as they mine their blocks. And they write that into this tenure change transaction. And this is the part that prevents forking. Um, and this is going to live as a sort of a, a consensus critical artifact on the stacks chain itself. 
And so at this point, we've moved on to the next miner's tenure. And so these are, these are some of the key fields that are included in that tenure change transaction data. So we have the tenure consensus hash, and this is going to basically be a representation of the of the current tenure that the, that this miner is on. So this is going to be a consensus hash that corresponds to this. It's called a sortition. Um, and then what, we, what can actually happen is, let's say that a Bitcoin block was on longer than expected. What can happen is that stackers can extend a tenure, and if they were to do that as part of that transaction, we would keep this consensus hash of this tenure in that. So we would know that those two periods were correlated with the same this same minor tenure. And then we have the previous tenure consensus hash, which is just what it sounds like. It's a hash of the previous tender tenure. The burn view consensus hash is the hash of the last seen Bitcoin block. And then the previous tenure end is going to be an index block hash. So that's going to be the last stacks block from the previous tenure. And remember, we talked about how we, we need that field to tell the next miner what block it needs to build from. So that's why this is included there. And then we also have the... Uh, number of blocks that were included in the previous tenure. So that's kind of a high level overview of what this tenure change transaction actually looks like. And then what will happen is the tenure change block found transaction, once a winning miner is selected via their block commit transaction, then this tenure change block found transaction is then initiated. And what this does is this creates a transaction that is made available to miner for miners to download so that miners can include it in their first block. So miner A and B are both going to monitor for the, the availability of this data so that they can determine when miner A must stop producing blocks and that miner B can begin producing blocks. So once miner B gets the data from this transaction, then a couple of things are gonna happen. Um, first, miner B is gonna process any currently unprocessed stacks transactions up to, but um, excluding the Bitcoin block, which contains its tenure, so up to you know Bitcoin block that corresponds with Bitcoin miner A. Then it produces its tenure start block, which is gonna contain this tenure change block found transaction as its first transaction. So that's when it officially has begun now mining stacks blocks within its tenure, and then it'll start mining those transactions out of the mempool. And so this way we kind of make sure that when miner B comes in, it's taking everything that's currently in progress from what miner A hadn't actually officially mined yet, collecting all those, getting them mined along with this tenure change block found transaction, that officially marks the start of that miner's tenure, and then it's going to move on into mining transactions out of the mempool. So at this point, we have the final step, sub 7.3, are transactions finalized on Bitcoin? And this is the part that's going to make a little bit more sense, I think, in the next section when we kind of go through this little illustrated example. But at this point, we've got miner A, and our stacks transaction was submitted and mined during miner A's tenure. That transaction will be considered finalized on Bitcoin once miner B finishes their tenure and we've moved on to miner C. At that point, then that transaction can be considered finalized on Bitcoin because we will have that link of the first, that index block hash that we talked about that's included in the block commit transaction. So. That's sort of the big overview of exactly what's going to happen step by step of a transaction under Nakamoto consensus rules. So now let's go through and kind of look at an illustrated example of what this is going to look like. And lucky for you all, you get to enjoy my incredible art skills. So try not to be too intimidated. But we've got two groups of participants. We've got Alice, Bob, Charlie, and Dave, who are miners. And we've got a group of stackers. Now. Eugene wants to submit a Stacks transaction. So he uses his wallet, whether it's Leather or Xverse, maybe he's participating in some Bitcoin DeFi protocol, whatever he's doing, he's going to submit a Stacks transaction, broadcast it up to the Stacks network. At this point, it's going to be sitting in the mempool. And let's say that Eugene happened to submit his transaction right in the middle of Alice's tenure. So Alice is going to be the first Stacks miner, and she's in this Bitcoin block right here, and Eugene's transaction ends up getting picked up and mined in stacks block number four within Alice's tenure. Then what's going to happen is Alice is going to continue mining stacks blocks until the end of her tenure, at which a tenure change is going to take place, and then we're going to switch over to Bob's tenure. So that's sort of the high-level process of what's going to happen in our little hypothetical example here. So what is actually going to happen during that tenure change 
is that we've got Alice's tenure here where she's mined eight stacks blocks within her tenure of this Bitcoin block. Now Bob comes in and what he's going to do is he's going to take stacks block number one from Alice's tenure and he is going to take that index block hash and he's going to add it to his block commit transaction on the Bitcoin chain. And then the stackers are going to detect that winning block commit and they are going to then initiate a tenure change transaction on the stack side that is going to include the last signed block by Alice, which in this case is stacks block number eight. And then what's going to happen is Bob is going to begin his tenure, and he must build on top of this last signed block, which in this case is block number eight. And now we've started Bob's tenure. So let's move on to the last step of this. And this is where hopefully a lot of things will start to come together and you can get sort of a picture of exactly what is happening when we do these things. So right here, we've got all, we've got three of our miners here, Alice, Bob, and Char Charlie, we've got their tenures outlined. So remember, our hypothetical, hypothetical transaction that Eugene submitted is over here in block A4 within Alice's tenure. So Alice produces her blocks and then that tenure change that we just looked at happens to where now Bob has to build off of block A8, and he starts building off at stacks block B1. He goes through his tenure, and now this is where the actual point of Bitcoin finality happens, because now the third miner, Charlie, comes in, goes through the same process. He submits his block commit transaction, but he has the hash of the state of stacks block B1 written to his, which is now written on the Bitcoin chain. And so if you look at the top here, that tenure change between Bob and Charlie is when Eugene's transaction in block A4 can be considered finalized with Bitcoin because we have that, now we have that connected chain between block A1 and block B1 written into Bitcoin. And so at this point, now we can consider Eugene's transaction finalized. <clears throat> Charlie will begin his tenure and then the process will repeat with Dave, the next miner, and so on and so on. And so that process right there is sort of the, that's the big picture overview of exactly what is happening with Stacks transactions under Nakamoto consensus rules. And remember from Eugene's perspective, from his interaction with whatever web app he might be using, that initial first transaction where he just was utilizing Stacks and it had to be confirmed in the Stacks block, that took seconds. So that took maybe, you know, five to 10 seconds. And then what happened is over the course of the rest of that Bitcoin block, plus the next one, then that stacks transaction achieved Bitcoin finality. And so at that point, it would be as hard to reverse Eugene's transaction as it would be to reverse the state of Bitcoin all the way up to Bob's tenure. And so that is sort of the big picture high level of how we can envision Bitcoin finality actually working. And so this whole process is how Nakamoto is going to merge security with speed to lay the foundation of a, of a decentralized economy built on Bitcoin. So hopefully today gave you a better idea and helped you kind of visualize exactly what's happening when we talk about fast transactions and Bitcoin finality on Nakamoto. Keep an eye out for all the different releases of Nakamoto, the public test nets coming out soon. <clears throat> Apps are going to be moving over to Nakamoto. Thanks so much for watching. Hopefully this was helpful and I'll see you all soon.